The Persecution, under Valerian, A. D. 257. Began under Valerian, in the month of April, 257, and continued for three years and six months. The martyrs that fell in this persecution were innumerable, and their tortures and deaths as various and painful. The most eminent martyrs were the following, though neither rank, sex, nor age were regarded. Rufina and Secunda were two beautiful and accomplished ladies, daughters of Asterius, a gentleman of eminence in Rome. Rufina, the elder, was designed in marriage for Armentarius, a young nobleman, Secunda, the younger, for Varinus, a person of rank and opulence. The suitors, at the time of the persecutions commencing, were both Christians, but when danger appeared, to save their fortunes, they renounced their faith. They took great pains to persuade the ladies to do the same, but, disappointed in their purpose, the lovers were base enough to inform against the ladies, who, being apprehended as Christians, were brought before Junius Donatus, governor of Rome, where, a. d. 257, they sealed their martyrdom with their blood. Stephen, bishop of Rome, was beheaded in the same year, and about that time Saturninus, the pious Orthodox bishop of Toulouse, refusing to sacrifice to idols, was treated with all the barbarous indignities imaginable, and fastened by the feet to the tail of a bull. Upon a signal given, the enraged animal was driven down the steps of the temple, by which the worthy martyr's brains were dashed out. Sextus succeeded Stephen as bishop of Rome. He is supposed to have been a Greek by birth or by extraction, and had for some time served in the capacity of a deacon under Stephen. His great fidelity, singular wisdom, and uncommon courage distinguished him upon many occasions, and the happy conclusion of a controversy with some heretics is generally ascribed to his piety and prudence. In the year 258, Marcianus, who had the management of the Roman government, procured an order from the Emperor Valerian, to put to death all the Christian clergy in Rome, and hence the bishop with six of his deacons, suffered martyrdom in 258. Let us draw near to the fire of martyred Lawrence, that our cold hearts may be warmed thereby. The merciless tyrant, understanding him to be not only a minister of the sacraments, but a distributor also of the church riches, promised to himself a double prey, by the apprehension of one soul. First, with the rake of avarice to scrape to himself the treasure of poor Christians, then with the fiery fork of tyranny, so to toss and turmoil them, that they should wax weary of their profession. With furious face and cruel countenance, the greedy wolf demanded where this Lawrence had bestowed the substance of the church, who, craving three days' respite, promised to declare where the treasure might be had. In the meantime, he caused a good number of poor Christians to be congregated. So, when the day of his answer was come, the persecutor strictly charged him to stand to his promise. Then valiant Lawrence, stretching out his arms over the poor, said, These are the precious treasure of the church, these are the treasure indeed, in whom the faith of Christ reigneth, in whom Jesus Christ hath his mansion place. What more precious jewels can Christ have, than those in whom he hath promised to dwell? For so it is written, I was an hungered, and ye gave me meat, I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink, I was a stranger, and ye took me in. And again, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. What greater riches can Christ our Master possess, than the poor people in whom he loveth to be seen? Oh, what tongue is able to express the fury and madness of the tyrant's heart? Now he stamped, he stared, he ramped, he fared as one out of his wits, his eyes like fire glowed, his mouth like a boar formed, his teeth like a hellhound grinned. Now, not a reasonable man, but a roaring lion, he might be called. Kindle the fire, he cried, of wood make no spare. Hath this villain deluded the emperor? Away with him, away with him, whip him with scourges, jerk him with rods, buffet him with fists, brain him with clubs. Jesteth the traitor with the emperor? Pinch him with fiery tongs, gird him with burning plates, bring out the strongest chains, and the fire forks, and the grated bed of iron, on the fire with it, bind the rebel hand and foot, and when the bed is fire hot, on with him, roast him, broil him, toss him, turn him, on pain of our high displeasure do every man his office, O ye tormentors. The word was no sooner spoken, but all was done. After many cruel handlings, this meek lamb was laid, I will not say on his fiery bed of iron, 
but on his soft bed of down. So mightily God wrought with his martyr Lawrence, so miraculously God tempered his element the fire, that it became not a bed of consuming pain, but a pallet of nourishing rest. In Africa the persecution raged with peculiar violence, many thousands received the crown of martyrdom, among whom the following were the most distinguished characters. Cyprian, Bishop of Carthage, an eminent prelate, and a pious ornament of the church. The brightness of his genius was tempered by the solidity of his judgment, and with all the accomplishments of the gentleman, he blended the virtues of a Christian. His doctrines were orthodox and pure, his language easy and elegant, and his manners graceful and winning, in fine, he was both the pious and polite preacher. In his youth he was educated in the principles of gentilism, and having a considerable fortune, he lived in the very extravagance of splendor, and all the dignity of pomp. About the year 246, Coecilius, a Christian minister of Carthage, became the happy instrument of Cyprian's conversion, on which account, and for the great love that he always afterward bore for the author of his conversion, he was termed Coecilius Cyprian. Previous to his baptism, he studied the scriptures with care and being struck with the beauties of the truths they contained, he determined to practice the virtues therein recommended. Subsequent to his baptism, he sold his estate, distributed the money among the poor, dressed himself in plain attire, and commenced the life of austerity. He was soon after made a presbyter, and, being greatly admired for his virtues and works, on the death of Donatus, in a. d. 248, he was almost unanimously elected Bishop of Carthage. Cyprian's care not only extended over Carthage, but to Numidia and Mauritania. In all his transactions he took great care to ask the advice of his clergy, knowing that unanimity alone could be of service to the church, this being one of his maxims, that the bishop was in the church, and the church in the bishop, so that unity can only be preserved by a close connection between the pastor and his flock. In a. d. 250, Cyprian was publicly proscribed by the Emperor Decius, under the appellation of Coecilius Cyprian, Bishop of the Christians, and the universal cry of the pagans was, Cyprian to the lions, Cyprian to the beasts. The bishop, however, withdrew from the rage of the populace, and his effects were immediately confiscated. During his retirement, he wrote thirty pious and elegant letters to his flock, but several schisms that then crept into the church, gave him great uneasiness. The rigor of the persecution abating, he returned to Carthage, and did everything in his power to expunge erroneous opinions. A terrible plague breaking out in Carthage, it was as usual, laid to the charge of the Christians, and the magistrates began to persecute accordingly, which occasioned an epistle from them to Cyprian, in answer to which he vindicates the cause of Christianity. A. D. 257, Cyprian was brought before the proconsul Aspasius Paternus, who exiled him to a little city on the Libyan Sea. On the death of this proconsul, he returned to Carthage, but was soon after seized, and carried before the new governor, who condemned him to be beheaded, which sentence was executed on the 14th of September, a. d. 258. The disciples of Cyprian, martyred in this persecution, were Lucius, Flavian, Victoricus, Remus, Montanus, Julian, Primulus, and Donatian. At Utica, a most terrible tragedy was exhibited. 300 Christians were, by the orders of the proconsul, placed round a burning lime kiln. A pan of coals and incense being prepared, they were commanded either to sacrifice to Jupiter, or to be thrown into the kiln. Unanimously refusing, they bravely jumped into the pit, and were immediately suffocated. Fructuosus, Bishop of Tarragon, in Spain, and his two deacons, Agorius and Eulogius, were burnt for being Christians. Alexander, Malchus, and Priscus, three Christians of Palestine, with a woman of the same place, voluntarily accused themselves of being Christians, on which account they were sentenced to be devoured by tigers, which sentence was executed accordingly. Maxima, Donatilla, and Secunda, three virgins of Tuberga, had gall and vinegar given them to drink, were then severely scourged, tormented on a gibbet, rubbed with lime, scorched on a gridiron, worried by wild beasts and at length beheaded. It is here proper to take notice of the singular but miserable fate of the Emperor Valerian, who had so long and so terribly persecuted the Christians. This tyrant, by a stratagem, 
was taken prisoner by Saper, Emperor of Persia, who carried him into his own country, and there treated him with the most unexampled indignity, making him kneel down as the meanest slave, and treading upon him as a footstool when he mounted his horse. After having kept him for the space of seven years in the subject state of slavery, he caused his eyes to be put out, though he was then eighty-three years of age. This not satiating his desire of revenge, he soon after ordered his body to be flayed alive, and rubbed with salt, under which torments he expired, and thus fell one of the most tyrannical emperors of Rome, and one of the greatest persecutors of the Christians. A. D. 260, Gallienus, the son of Valerian, succeeded him, and during his reign, a few martyrs accepted, the church enjoyed peace for some years.